Hi friend, welcome to this Advent study. I am so glad that you're here. I'm really looking forward to this ritual that will help us prepare our hearts for the celebration of Christmas. And I don't know where you are sitting right now or what time of the day it is where you are, but for myself, I tend to study God's word first thing in the morning. This is how I start my day or enjoy starting my day. And I have the freedom and flexibility to do that. I'm really grateful for it. So anyway, all that to say, I am not sitting next to my Christmas tree. I am at my desk. I don't have my Advent wreath here. And so for Christmas, though, I love candles. <laughs> like when it gets dark, I like to light up the Christmas tree and light a bunch of candles. And even though it's daytime, this is going to be my little ritual for uh, my Advent study is lighting a candle. You can't see it, but I also have my little, this is my little tea set. And so I'm drinking tea uh, with the Lord and lighting a candle. And then let's just open up with prayer, shall we? Uh, Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. You have blessed us, God, that we might know you. And Lord, we don't want to just know you like in our heads. Uh, we don't really need just more knowledge about you or more Bible knowledge. God, we want to experience you. We want that intimate knowing. Uh, we want to enjoy you in the most intimate way, even as I don't know, Lord, even in the midst of the what can be chaotic, this chaotic season of preparing for Christmas. Oh, Lord, would you quiet our hearts and our minds and our spirits to just know and enjoy you through your word. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus name. Amen. All right, friends, so we are looking at scripture in this study that pertains to the birth of Jesus Christ, and day one is Luke chapter one, verses one through seven, so I'll go ahead and read. Luke says this, "...in as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statues of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years." All right, friends, so you know if you have done another study with me, I like to ask those who, what, where, why, and how kinds of questions. And I want to just start off today by saying, look, you may have observed other things than what I observed. There is so much to observe. We don't have all day to observe everything, but what stands out? What jumps out to us today as we answer these questions? So that's what I'm sharing. I'm sharing with you what I I noticed today, like next year when I go through these passages in preparation for Christmas, I might notice some other things, but here's what I noticed today. All right, so I do ask, as usual, that who question. Who do we have in this passage? And number one, I see the author, which we know this gospel is according to Luke. So I'm, I'm asking, I'm making an observation, and I'm also interpreting. I'm answering the who here. All right, Luke number one is is uh, he he's the writer of this account, and then he is writing to Theophilus. And I went ahead and tried to understand. Okay, who is? Theophilus and friends for this I I really I need to look at a commentary or um, uh, my study Bible to answer this question now I can find a cross-reference which 
is found in, where did I find that? Oh, I didn't jot it down. Oh, well, I think it's Acts chapter one, verse one, because Luke also writes that book and he's writing it to Acts. So we see a cross-reference. Theophilus, his name means lover of God. And this most likely is a, a particular person at a particular time and place, right? And uh, most excellent, Luke deems him as most excellent and that most likely refers to or, or just signifies honor. We see this term utilized later in the book of Acts in reference to some leaders and kings. All right, so that's the who of the first part of the passage. The who down below, uh, we see that Luke introduces us to Herod and Zechariah and Elizabeth, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So we have the who, and I asked who are they, which I just already have answered for us. And I asked about the what, what is going on here? Well, Luke tells us he is compiling a narrative of the things that have been accomplished. And so my question was, what things, what are the things? This is kind of a generic term that he uses twice. He also uses it in verse four, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. All right. So my question was, what things, what things? And there are two things here, um, two different things. The first one, which is mentioned in verse one is uh, the word, where did I jot that down? It's a Greek word. When I looked that up in the Bible dictionary, oh, I put it over here in my keyword column and I defined it. Number one, the first one in verse one is a Greek word, pragma, and it's an event. So this, this could read in verse one to compile a narrative of the events that have been accomplished or taken place among us, all right? Something that has happened at a certain place and at a certain time, very real events. He's, uh, he's compiling these events into, what does he say, into, um, into an orderly account. I like that. And I'll come back to that because that was one of my key words. It just jumped out to me today. So that's uh, things number one. Things number two in verse four, that you may have certainty. Another one of my key words that jumped out to me today. I I I'd love to know what jumped out to you. I'll just be sharing. <laughs> well, I'm the only one here. So I'll be sharing what jumps out to me. Um, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This second things is a completely different word in the Greek. It's logos, uh, meaning message. All right. So that's very different from pragmas uh, event, right? We have logos message, which is the gospel here. It's something, yeah, it's a message to be communicated. And there is a specific message here, which Luke uses this word also in verse two, logos, when he says, uh, just as though who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, the word, that's the same word as things down in verse four. All right, I feel like I said that using a lot of words and there probably was a quicker and easier way to say that, but do you get the, do you get the idea? Or I hope that it's clear that logos, this word for message is used twice, uh, once in verse two and once in verse four. So um, what we're trying to what we're trying to understand is what does Luke mean in these first four verses? Uh, so he also used these two words. I already said the other two key words that I, I don't know, they just jumped out to me. I put them in my keyword column. I looked them up. One was this word orderly. I think, you know, my life has just been so chaotic recently in recent days, maybe really for a whole year. 
<laughs> now. And then, you know, preparing for the holidays just adds another layer to it. So something that is orderly, th that word orderly just, whoa, it just jumped off the page. And it means when I looked it up, it means successively in proper order, in proper sequence. So uh, he is wanting to give not just this random chaotic account, but a very orderly account. And we see this word in Acts chapter 11, verse 4, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. All right, so love that. And why is he doing all of this? This was another one of my questions. Why does he want to write this orderly account? Because he wants Theophilus to have certainty concerning the things he has been taught. And that word certainty jumped out to me. That's a state of having or feeling no doubt. No doubt. Uh, I don't know. I think that's a rare feeling today, don't you? This feeling of certainty, this thinking of certainty, zero doubt, zero doubt. I love that. So friends, how can we summarize this? What does Luke mean in these first few passages? How do we interpret it? I think my summary or my main point uh, really summarizes it. Luke writes an orderly account of the word, the gospel, the good news message of Jesus for Theophilus. And he then down below, I put in the second part, he sets the stage by introducing Herod, the king of Judah. He introduces Zechariah and Elizabeth. These are righteous people who are barren. And I unpacked that quite a bit too. I wanted to know what do we learn about these people? Like we learn Herod, he's the king of Judah. Uh, we learn about Zechariah and Elizabeth. These things, Zacharias is a priest in the division of Abijah. His wife is Elizabeth. She's a daughter from this line of Aaron. He was the brothers of, brother of Moses. So this is, you know, they're, they're, they're from good stock we might say. Uh, number three, beyond having uh, coming from this godly line of people, they both are righteous before God. And Luke tells us what he means by this. He explains it as they are walking blamelessly. They are living blamelessly. And I looked up that word meaning free of guilt in all the commandments and statues of the Lord. All right, so there's not one place where they are guilty. Friends, who else can say that? I mean, that jumps off the page to me. I think uh, in my mind, when I think of Zechariah, you know, I'm familiar with this Christmas story and I think, oh wow, he makes a big mistake in not believing. Look, this man was blameless. He was guilt-free. But we also learn, Luke makes it clear that they have no child, that Elizabeth is barren, and that they are advanced in years. And if we put on our first century ancient Near East classes, we would understand this to mean that they would feel as if uh, they have not found God's favor. They have not been blessed by him, uh, almost to the point of feeling cursed by him. And so the question for the ancient Near East listener to the receiver of this letter, to the re, to probably Theophilus, is, is why uh, surely they must be guilty in some way as since they have not been favored by God in this way. So Luke is setting up this story. Uh, they have no children. They are barren. They are advanced in years. Almost took me back to Abraham and Sarah, right? Uh, there's probably a connection. We definitely see this theme of barrenness throughout scripture. All right, friends, that was a lot. I talked a lot about what I noticed today. How am I applying it? 
I am praising God. I mean, I, I God cares. I wrote down God cares about order and certainly certainty for Luke to uh, write write this account. Um, you know, and I already shared life has felt very very chaotic, and there's something about just reading this today. Um, well, I guess, you know, when life is chaotic, how do I put it? it I, I feel like not only is life chaotic, but my thoughts and my feelings kind of begin to get chaotic. Does that make sense? I don't know how to put that into words, but they become maybe unsettled in a way. And so that can even happen concerning my beliefs about God and my beliefs about Jesus. They can become unstable in a way. And so there was something very uh, grounding about today's passage that God is a God of order and a God of certainty, and he wants this for my life. And so my application is one, to praise him for this, and number two is to rest, to have certainty, to have no doubt in the good news of Jesus and his way of salvation. And so I am, you know, I this, this passage helps me commit to this little Advent ritual of being in his world word for this season as we prepare our hearts and as I prepare my heart for celebrating Christmas. Friend, I hope that gives you uh, a good idea of where I landed for today and encourages you as well. I'll look forward to tomorrow. Mm -hmm.